conversation today um, where uh, a woman was asked, you know, has she gotten the vaccine? And she said no. Um, and then the response was, you know, what is there a particular reason? And her response was exactly that. Um, you know, I'm just not really sure about it. It's very new. Um, you know, I, I want them to do more testing before I, I, you know, do it. And and she was black, and I know that she was coming from a place because I've heard this many times before, where in in our community there mm -hmm. is suspicion about you know having vaccinations being done on you with, especially with if you don't have a lot of information about it. Um, a lot of people know that there were experiments done on black people back in the day to make them yeah. sterile or to that had all kinds of adverse effects. And I, I hear that continuously coming up. So what are your thoughts about that? Do you yeah, think that's I, playing I, it? <laughs> I see people referencing and it's the Tuskegee syphilis experiments. It, that, that's the, the easiest one. Mm -hmm. And I like to point out that, yeah, that was something that was carried out, um, you know, with the assistance of certain governments, uh, gov government uh local governments, I should say, and the, um, uh, what's up in Maryland? I can't remember the name of it. John Hopkins, uh, mm -hmm. John Hopkins University, actually, uh, I, th I think assisted with that. I might be confusing that with the Gila situation from Henrietta Lacks, I may be, but uh, that's something that I do consider a legitimate concern because, you know, that, that sets a precedent, I, I get it. Um, what I like to point out is that if you think that that's actually happening, right? How are they specifically going to target black people? In in this case, there's three different vaccines out right now. Major, so Johnson Johnson, Moderna, and Pfizer. So between the three, which one do you think is tainted, or are all three tainted? If that's the case, then how are they specifically finding black people to infect? Because if, if and at, for the Tuskegee syphilis experiment, there was one provider, there was, you know, well, no cocktail in this case, but just, you know, placebo. Uh, so the aspects of this whole thing are way different. Mm -hmm. And when you actually talk to people about how this conspiracy they think is happening actually works, they don't know. They're just, they'll, they'll use that as a reference, but they can't actually tell you how this thing is being done. Uh, so I said, so, okay, fine. But if, if you don't have an alternative and you're just fear mongering, then you're not protecting yourself because the virus is already shown to be very, very detrimental to people of color, especially black folks. And that right. has a lot to do with comorbidities. People with COPD, people who are overweight are, are prime candidates for getting really fucked up by this thing. So mm -hmm. it's a double whammy. You have people fear mongering based on real events, and then you have the virus itself that is impacting black folks more. And so it's like, you know, what you're stuck between a rock and a hard spot. And I don't have any, any quick solutions uh, for this other than to try and educate people, even my own family members, because <laughs> I, yeah. huh. I, mean, I mean, that's usually my response as well. I usually just go straight to the fact that we know that this is a deadly disease and statistically, if you're black, you're less likely to survive it. You know, yeah. for, for all of the reasons you just mentioned, the comorbidity issues, uh, lack of access to good healthcare, um, for a number of reasons, black people statistically have a higher, if, if I'm remembering the statistic correctly, and I'll, I'll ask people to double check that, don't quote me, but it seems that black people have a higher uh, death rate uh, for COVID than the the broader demographics. And so that's that alone would be cause to, for me, you know, that, that would be reason enough to take a chance with, even if you thought that, you know, if you had suspicions, these conspiracy theories, uh, you know, if you get it, you know, you could die from it. It just, um, and that's really kind of the best argument that I can come up with. But I, I do want to ask about the persistence of this virus and just kind of get your opinion. Is COVID here to stay? Are we ever going to like eradicate it? Are the, uh, is getting vaccinated going to cure it? Or is this something, are we just going to have to keep, is it here to stay basically is I, what I want to know. I think it's, it's kind of going to be going to become, you know, our new flu. Uh, you know, yeah. the flu too lets you boogaloo, essentially. <laughs> uh, <laughs> because it's if it was going to go, it would have left by now. 
Uh, I, I think that we've we've been through an entire year of it, and it's still here. It'll it's, keep evolving, won't it? Like mutating yeah. into new strains and. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And, it, and we've already we, we've predicted that something like this was going to happen. But you, have you have heard people talk about a super flu? Have you heard people talk about or mention super flu? I've so, heard. So the and the idea of that is that there are certain zoonotic pathogens that uh, will mutate to the point that uh, our current interventions yeah. are just not going to work. Uh, it's just a natural course of things. Uh, you you keep deferring to, uh, or I should say, you keep providing pools of people in which these pathogens can replicate, you will inevitably get one strain that can outcompete the rest. Uh, and it's just that evolution, that's how evolution works. The one that survives is allowed to proliferate. Well, surviving in this case means circumventing the interventions, the vaccines, uh, antibiotics for the bacterial uh, uh, based pathogens. Uh, and so that's just how nature works. And so our super flu in this case- Drag I, are, you, are you trying to say that evolution is definitely true? Absolutely, absolutely. It's not evolution in, in the eyes of certain people, but but evolution in, at its core, uh, being being that here is an entity that is allowed to replicate uh, successfully and go on and proliferate and operate in our environment. That's that's the the base mechanics. Now, in this case, a virus is technically not an organism, but uh, the mechanics are, are, are still the same, are still the same, the mm -hmm. same things uh, involved. Because I know you wanted to get into uh, evolution and talk a little bit about younger creationists, one of my, my favorite topics, as a matter of fact. <laughs> yeah, I was going to touch on that a little bit. And I just to kind of get your uh, perspective on how do you deal with evolution denial? I mean, clearly there's plenty of evidence in science. And one of the things that I often hear from young earth creationists or even old earth creationists, because not every old earth creationist accepts evolution either. Some of them do and some of them don't. But the, the most common objection I hear is that, oh, well, that's just microevolution. That's different from macroevolution. And I don't think they know what they're talking about even when they say it. Um, so <laughs> what do you think about that? Uh, and so here's what I found, and this is, man, this is after years and years and years of talking to these people, there are different types of evolution denialists, right? You have the people who are absolutely married to Ken Hoban and just repeat the stupid stuff that he says. Uh, and they have all these different little categories of chemical evolution and astrological or evolution, whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, there are people who are looking, and this is the vast majority of younger creationists who are anti-evolution, they're looking for Pokemon evolution. They're not looking for actual evolution where you have a population of organisms and the ones that are best adapted to the environment get to breed and, and pass their genetics on. They're looking for one animal changing into another animal. Yes, gross, <laughs> and I call it, when I say gross anatomical change, that's what they're looking for. And if you cannot show them in one organism's lifetime gross anatomical change, then they're not going to accept it because that's their conception of what evolution is: one organism morphing into another one. It's such a straw man argument, though. Yeah. Why do they think that that's what evolution is? Is that something that religion teaches people that evolution is when they're trying to destroy it? Or well, not necessarily religion, but I think certain religious people, like uh, like Ken Hoban, uh, what's the other guy's name? Uh, Ken Ham is a Ken Ham is a good one. Yeah. So uh, they yeah. they frame evolution because they're teachers, obviously. Uh, they frame evolution. That's a scary thought. <laughs> uh, Hoven has actually taught people, believe it or not. Uh, but it's they frame it such that if you can't show me Pokemon evolution, then the modern synthesis evidently is, is false. And that's sort of the people who understand the difference between Darwinian evolution and the modern, or let's just say the neo-modern synthesis, mm. that really tells you a lot about them. Because people who understand evolution, current evolution, don't say Darwinian evolution. Because Darwinian evolution is without the advances of Mendelian genetics. And you can't discuss evolution without 
genetics, like they, they go hand in hand. Uh, so that, by the way, for people who are wanting to get into these discussions and debates with theists, if they refer to it as Darwinian evolution, that should, you should pick up on that instantly that they are like at least 150 years behind the times and they don't know what they're talking about. 